you guys for taking that moment doing that. The Lord's got a great word for us today. And I do want to say one more time, I'm really glad to have a good friend, Rick, in here with me. And you guys are going to find he's got a lot of great things to say. And he's going to help me out today as we discuss and process this week. I would just throw in there, it's also good to have my friend Seth Boyd here. He's been hanging out with us all week. And uh, he's a great guy. Love that he's here. He loves me and I love him. So, we're pals. God's good. It's good to have friends. It's good to have people who are like-minded, all right? It's a great thing. You need that, guys. You need to have some close friends and leadership. It's going to help you out, okay? All right, we're going to have a great time today. God's given us a wonderful word. Um, And uh, the topic today is undercover, all right? And a lot of this can be found in a book called Undercover by John Bevere. And so that is, without question, the recommendation for you today, to get your hands on a copy of Undercover by John Bevere, okay? Now, when you, if you go to search for that on Barnes & Nobles or online or something, that's two words, okay? It's not actually together. Our church actually just finished watching the, the series. series. Very yes. cool. All right. All right. Epic. So just remember, I'm not John Bevere, so I didn't write a book, so I probably will be a lot different. <laughs> All right? So that's very cool, though. John Bevere is an incredible writer. Mm-hmm. This is an amazing book. And I promise you, I won't touch the surface today. Okay? So you should really get this book. It'll improve your life. It did not wind up on the recommendations because I was going to talk about it today. Okay? So write that down. Get this book or get that series if you can afford that series. And it will definitely change your life. Okay? An incredible word. All right? So we're going to talk a little bit about undercover. Undercover, this phrase can apply to a vast number of situations it's in its simplest form it could describe a small child nestled under the warmth and protection of a blanket or behind the protective frame of a parent in danger a civilian description may uh, describe a city that's under police or military protection it could describe an animal hidden away in a thicket or a cave there's nothing worse than hunting deer and that deer is undercover Okay, you can't see it enough to shoot it, okay? That's that's the challenges sometimes. Undercover, there's protection, which is very cool. Or it could also describe a family enjoying a shelter and safety of their home while a storm rages outside. Well, I grew up in Mississippi, and we have crazy storms. We have a lot of tornadoes. And one day after school, we were all hanging out at church, and we just had this crazy storm come through. And um, in the South, we got our own language. And we call uh, certain places around the area where there's uh, kind of a valley kind of setting where you've got these fields and they kind of come down in a low spot. And they call those bottoms, okay? I like that. Call them bottoms, all right? And so there was one nearby that's a very large one. And in that day, seven tornadoes touched down in that one location and it was just like I mean it was not far from the church at all we were standing outside because we were so used to it we we like to watch it okay and so we were standing outside and could literally look up and see clouds just like funneling just spinning it was just the coolest thing you know they were just spinning it's kind of called like a funnel cloud but they really wasn't coming down so you could just watch the clouds just kind of swirling so all these guys are out in the parking lot we're just we're just loving it. It's just awesome, okay? But then, you know, it kind of got a little scary. And then we all rushed into the church because things started changing. I mean, somebody drove by and said, hey, just over the bend, there is seven tornadoes. And so that kind of changed our feelings a little bit, and we kind of rushed in to that church. And then as soon as we got in that church building, we were comfortable. We were not so worried because we were under the cover of that building. I remember my wife, she was in here with us yesterday, She grew up in a location in the country where they don't have tornadoes. And the first time she went home to visit with me, we had a tornado at night. And it was raging, all right? We live in this little nothing town. Nothing, okay? 500 people. And so we don't have, like, poles with sirens on them. We have a fire truck, and it drives through town when there's a tornado. (laughs) We just sacrifice our fire. It's like, throw them to the tornado. Feed them to the tornado. Maybe it will leave, kind of thing. And so... My wife and I just had dinner at the one of the only restaurants in town, which is a truck stop called Flicks. And uh, you can buy t-shirts there, by the way. It says Flicks Amico on them. 
and everybody at Bible College would go home with us just to eat a Flix and buy a Flix t-shirt. That's just a boring life we live. Okay? And so my wife's with me, and it's a tornado, and I'm used to it, and I'm just driving through town, fire trucks passing me by. It's, you can see, like, the signs literally starting to, like, fall over like this. And where there's the gas pumps, and they had the overhang, that thing was just shaking, you know? And I'm just like, this is awesome. I'm not even thinking about her. And I look over, and she is ready. She's about to die. She, she's turning colors. You know, and she's thinking, what are we doing? We're driving through town. And she's like, what's that fire truck for? Well, that means that the tornado is really close by. You know, and she's just terrified. And me, I'm like in my car. I can't feel the rain. I can't feel the wind. I'm pretty comfortable because I'm used to it, right? Now, there's been times before where me and a friend, and he... He was doing a recording. He played drums, and he was very talented. And we went to his recording. We were in Arkansas. If you know anything about Arkansas, they have lots of tornadoes. The advantage in Arkansas is all there is there is flat fields. There's hardly any trees. I mean, you can look and just see forever. And so when tornadoes come, you can see them when they're on their way. And so at the end of the day, the sirens started going off. And this place where we were doing the recording was outside of town. So we, everybody says, we got to go. Well, me and this guy, we're not familiar with the city. So we're like, well, where do we go, you know? And so we're driving into town, and we're just kind of driving along. And next thing we know, the lightning started flashing, and it was kind of about when the sun was setting. So you could kind of see, but you couldn't. And so he's looking one way, and I'm looking the other, because we're trying to figure out where this tornado's at. And just so happens, lightning flashes, and we look the same way. And we can see the tornado, and it had touched down way out in the field. And literally, the sign, the speed limit sign was almost bending all the way over. I'd never seen it that bad. Let me tell you, the Maxima hit 95. We passed everybody that had left the recording center before us. We were, we were headed to town, yo. We went to a hotel. We, we, man, we rammed into that hotel. We ran up there in that room. We closed the curtains and everything. And the TV was on. All it was going was beep. And there's just little readings at the bottom. The tornado is at so-and-so. The tornado is at so-and-so. But, you know, we felt a little more comfortable when we got inside the hotel, okay? And it was because we were under a cover. And there was some safety under that cover. Um, I'm sorry. Take mine or something. Um, sorry about that. Um, so... It was a big challenge. Now, what was actually kind of funny is we were big sissies. We went to a Motel 6. You ever been to a Motel 6? Yeah. And we went in, and one rule when you're on a road trip is the first thing you do is you check the beds for spiders, just so you know. We pulled this bed back, and there was a spider as big as Rick's head laying there. We squealed like girls, grabbed our clothes, and ran. Ran. We went to the front and said, please give us our money back. This hotel is being attacked by... Massive spiders. <laughs> then we were even willing to take the tornado on. We got in the car, drove up the street a little further to Motel 8 because they don't have spiders, just so you know, okay? So stay away from Motel 6 because they breed spiders there. All right? <laughs> You're right. Yes, do it. I'm telling you. Plus, if you ever been in a Motel 6 and you find one without spiders, the walls are this thick. Literally. You can hear everything that happens on the other side of the room. It's super scary. So if they're that thick, you're not going to survive a tornado. So just don't go there. They got spiders and they're not tornado proof. All right? But the reality is, is there's something nice and something special about being undercover. It's an, it's an important thing. Taking this point a little bit further, we can pull these two words together and come up with another term. You put those two words together and you get undercover once again. This term describes the safety found in hidden identities. An agent who is undercover can move freely about without being apprehended by his enemy. His government has put him under the cover of an alias and he is a free agent in a hostile area. Okay, There's something special about that. I like that. That would preach. When it talks about an agent who is undercover can move freely about without being apprehended by his enemy. That right there is the whole message. There's something special about being undercover. You can move freely. There's some freedom there. No matter how we use this word or phrase, they all seem to include protection and freedom when you're undercover. 
That is the benefit. That is the blessing of being undercover. You have protection and you have freedom. The real question is this. How does this term undercover apply to Christians? David writes, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and Him I will trust. That's Psalms 91, 1 through 2. Once again, we see protection for those who are undercover. You see that? He's got a fortress and a refuge when he runs to God. Because God is covering him. The key words in that statement is he who. So who is really undercover? Okay? Who is the person that's really undercover? And the answer is simply anyone who is under God's authority is undercover. Okay? Anyone who is under God's authority is undercover. And we'll qualify that and bring some more description and definition to that throughout this day. Okay, It is super critical, guys, that you realize now that freedom and protection comes from being undercover. You will never have more freedom in your life and more protection in your life than when you are submitted to authority and resting under God's cover. Okay? You can move about freely and the enemy won't get you. Okay? It's an amazing and it's a wonderful thing. Right? One illustration is Adam and Eve. Think about their life. Man, they were living it up. They were at the top of the food chain. They were running. They were running the uh, garden of Eden. They were the boss. They got to meet with Jesus every day. They didn't have any needs. Okay, there was no sin. Life was perfect. All right? It was perfect. And the moment that they disobeyed God and stepped out from under his uh, cover, they no longer could move about freely, and they did not have his protection. Okay, it's a really simple example. Here's the thing. The root of all sin is disobedience. It's disobedience. And when you disobey God, you're stepping out from under his cover. You are separating yourself from him. The Bible says he cannot share you with sin. He cannot abide where sin is. And so the moment that you disobey him, you are sinning. And when that sin moves in your life, he cannot abide in your heart. And you're separating yourself from him. You're not under his cover. You're not protected anymore. And you are not free. You may think you're free. But I promise you, you are not free when you are not under his cover, okay? You are becoming bound by sin. And you don't even know it most of the time. Right? But... When you abide by his principles, when you follow his admonishments and his commands and his requests and his word, you have God's protection on your life. And you can move about freely and do great things in his kingdom as leaders and ministers in the ministry when you're under his cover. Your provision as well as protection could be blocked or even cut off as you disconnect yourselves from the source of life. That's why even the smallest sin makes a big difference. I guess if you could say it's small. It's because it creates a disconnect from God. And when that disconnect happens, you're not under his authority or his cover anymore. Here's what's so challenging about this topic. Is that this topic goes against current. The current. It goes against mainstream culture, guys. All right? This is why it's so hard to understand this sometimes. This is going against the current when you're willing to embrace this principle in the Word of God. Because our world is not about being under authority at all. Right. They push being dependent, or independent, I'm sorry. They push being independent. They want you to be or grab a hold of a mentality that says, I don't need anybody. I can pay my own bills, I can get my own car, I don't need anything. They push that. They say that's a strength. Okay? When in reality, that's just deception. The moment you think you don't need anybody, you are weak. And you're in a dangerous place. And that's what this culture does to us. It makes us think that. Then we get isolated and the devil just destroys us. He destroys us. And so this is very opposite 
of our world when you're willing to get under God's cover, cover and it's very challenging to us because it does mean we have to go against the current. Authority is not a popular word. We shudder because we don't see it from God's perspective. We have allowed the current world culture to affect our view of submission and authority. Okay? We allow it to affect our view of submission and authority. God is and has always been countercultural. Right? Remember that. God's people are and have always been countercultural. In God's kingdom, you must go against the current. I promise you, God is not going to change anything in His Word just to appease a culture or people. Right. Not even His own children. He's written it, it's solid, and it's not going to change. And so you have to, I want to tell you right now, you might as well just recognize that if you're, especially if you're going to be a leader, but if you're going to be an authentic Christian, you're going to have to understand that means you're going to have to go against the current. You're going to have to become counter-cultural. They're doing some things, and you're not going to do them because you're being set apart. One of Seth's favorite things to say is, are you going to be authentic or accepted? All right? Are you going to be authentic or accepted? All right? Being accepted, that's just going with the flow. Being authentic is going against the current. That's becoming countercultural. Okay? And you're just going to have to recognize that. It's disappointing when you see young people and they want to have God in their life and they want to be used by Him, but they don't want to be different than anybody else. And they're not understanding that it's just not how it works. You're going to have to be different. Okay? You're going to have to submit to God's Word and His authority and His plan if you're going to be able to be used by Him. We have been programmed to think differently from the foundational truths we're talking about today. The reason this principle is so hard for Americans to understand is fundamental. These are kingdom principles, and we live in a dip diplomatic or democratic sorry, mindset. Okay? Think about that. These are kingdom principles. There's a big difference between a kingdom and a democracy. A massive difference. And we go get so used to democracy. But we have to remember this is not a democracy. This is a kingdom. A kingdom is ruled by one king. All right? One king rules a kingdom. The king of kings is not superseded by or subject to popular opinion, voting, or polls. The laws are not swayed by what makes me comfortable. you got to understand that if you and a group of people decide that you don't like Galatians 6 and 1, you can't just do a vote and get rid of it. That would be democracy. You're in a kingdom. The king has written the book, and your only option is to follow it and submit to it, okay? And you have to understand that. So many people want to vote. I mean, how often does this happen? You know, you let somebody get in office, and they're there for so long, now nobody likes them, oh, we're just going to vote them out. Okay? You can't vote God out. You can't vote his principles out. If you're going to be in his kingdom, you've got to follow the king. And you have to embrace that kingdom mentality if you're going to be able to understand what it means to truly be undercover. If we attempt to live as believers with a cultural mindset towards authority, we will be at best ineffective and at worst positioned for danger. Positioned for danger, okay? And even though this whole undercover thing, this whole authority and submission to authority is against the current, it is still very necessary, guys. You're going to have to have it in your life. We have some scriptures that will speak to us in regards to this. One of them is Romans 13, 1 through 2. And it says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. So let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. But every soul needs to be subjected to authority. It's in his book. He's asking us to do that. And the ultimate authority is God. So every soul in this room needs to be subjected to God and His authority. 
if you're going to fulfill His will. Otherwise, you're going to bring judgment on your own life. It's your own choices that's going to bring bad judgment on your life. If you read John Bevere's book, if you saw his series, he gives us a great example of the importance and significance of being under authority. Okay, He talks about the fact that he was at some church and he was the youth pastor and he had 24 staff members and he had felt like God had given him some direction and he was going to create these massive small groups throughout his city and he was going to call them parties and they were going to invite all these friends to their parties and that he felt like he was going to be able to reach like 2,000 to 2,500 people. He felt really strongly that he would have that kind of success. And he had worked very hard to have that success. And he was just about a week from having starting the parties. And he was in a pastoral meeting. And the senior pastor said that God spoke to me last night. And it's not God's will for us to have these small groups. For this church, I want you to cancel every small group immediately. And John Bevere got extremely upset. He was very hurt by that thought. And he could not keep his mouth shut. Okay? And so he had to say something. He had to counter that. And he wrestled with it. And he couldn't almost, he just couldn't give it up. And the senior pastor prevailed. And when he left, when he left the meeting, one of the other pastors on staff said, spoke to him and tried to encourage him a little bit. And he just looked at him and said, I don't even want to know what you want to say. And he walks out. And he goes home and he tells his wife what happened. And guess what she says? You have a problem, John. Wives aren't very cool sometimes. <laughs> all right, they're not very cool sometimes. They do that to us. They set us straight. They set us straight. You're right, all the time. And she says, you got a problem, John. And John's even madder now. Now his wife's on him. And he goes in and he sits down and he begins to talk to God a little bit. And guess what God tells John? He says, John, you got a problem. Isn't that bad? See, our wives know what they're talking about. Hey, Seth, could you kick that AC on back there? I think there's one back there. Sorry, guys. Is it hot in here, you guys? Yeah. All right, okay, you okay, Mariah? All right. Everybody okay? It is hot in here today. But so he's upset now because now God says he's got a problem. Well, what's going on, God? You're turning on me here. And so God speaks to him and says something really strong. He said, I'm not going to judge you based on how many souls you win. I'm going to judge you based on your submission to the pastor that I have set you up to support. Amen. Okay, everybody listen to that. And John thought he was in the right. He's thinking about souls. He has good intentions. God, what do you mean? I'm trying to win souls. And you're shutting me down, God. Isn't this your command to win souls? And God is very clear to him and gives him his true command. And his that is to be submitted to the pastor that he is sitting under. Whether he likes it or not. And that was literally what God said he was going to judge John Bevere on. And so some of you need to get this today. God is going to judge you based on your submission to the authority that he's put in your life. And i got some really sad news for you. That includes your parents. Because God put them in your life and they're in authority. He's going to judge you based on that. <coughs> He's going to be super excited if you win 25 kids from your high school. But he is not going to be happy about it if you're winning them, yet you're still not submitted to the authority in your life. He's concerned about that, guys. He's more concerned about that. God is more concerned about me, Chad Williams, and my submission and obedience to Pastor Aaron Soto than he is all the young people that I might reach in Appleton. Okay? And we have to understand that. He is looking at us and judging us based on our submission to authority. And it's very important that we understand that. By rejecting or fearing authority, we lose sight of the great protection, freedom, and benefits authority provides. I want to share with you a few benefits that you have when you are under God's authority. One is this, guys. Being submitted to His authority protects you from the deceiver. You need to understand something. Now, I'm not here to give the devil credit, but he is really good at deceiving people. He is the father of lies. He knows how to lie. 
he knows how to take good intentions and trick you with even good intentions and lead you down a bad path. And you, each one of you need authority in your life. You need a mentor in your life. You need a youth leader, a pastor, and parents that when you get some good intentions and some good ideas that you can talk to and they can give you some real, real instruction on whether it's wise to do that or not. Because you know what? Sometimes our leaders that God has placed in our life, they're there because they have more wisdom than we do. And when we take things to them, they can use the wisdom that they have and the relationship with God that they have and the call on their life to give us proper direction and help us navigate through life and through ideas and through burdens and, and all these different things that we're having to deal with as young people. And it will literally protect you from the deceiver, which is the enemy. I have people in my life, and when I get these bright ideas, I call them to see what they think. Okay? Because I've had bright ideas that weren't so bright. Oh, what you mean. <laughs> they were really on the lower side of bright. Really, it's kind of dark. More darker than brighter, kind of thing. I thought it was bright, but you know, it was good. Up, yeah. Nobody else did. So, but I throw those things at my leaders. You know, I even throw them at my peers sometimes. Just like, hey, what do you think? But I throw them at my mentors, my pastor, my leadership that's above me, the authority that's in my life, and say, hey, I need you to think about this. I need you to pray about this. I need you to tell me if this is a good idea or not. And then you know what they do? They pray. They support me. They speak into my life. They help me to keep from being deceived. And they say, you know what, Chad? God's priority for you is this. And if you go down that road, even though it's not a bad road, it's going to detour you from what God wants you to do right now. And it's going to deceive you and keep you from fulfilling God's will. So you shouldn't do that. Just keep doing this. Okay? And they will save me from even my good intentions. Right? But you got to understand that the enemy is very good. He's been doing this for a long time. And we are much better off when we were among a multitude of counselors. Of counsel. So that we have help. So the enemy cannot deceive us. Another thought is this. When you have, and this is obvious, it's not rocket science, when you have yourself under God's authority, you have His favor. I want to just throw something at you, a thought that was thrown at me before, okay? If you read in, the example is Herod. And if you read in Luke 23 and 9, Jesus is going before Herod. And Herod speaks to Jesus. It even says Herod was kind of looking forward to seeing Jesus because he had heard about a thing, a few things. But he talks to Jesus, and guess what Jesus does? Anybody tell me what Jesus did? He wouldn't speak, right? Anybody have an idea of why he wouldn't speak? Alex? A lot of people want to be like a performer for him because he could not hear about him. He was just like what he could do. That's good. I'm not going to argue that one. Any other ideas? John? respect the leaders about them. You got it. I've had it shared with me that God did not speak to Herod because Herod cut the head of his pastor off, which was John. John was Herod's spiritual leader. And what did Herod do to John? He had him beheaded. So Jesus did not speak to Herod because Herod had already chosen to step out from under the cover of his spiritual leadership and made his choice. And you need to understand this. If you cut the head off of the leaders that God puts in your life, He may not speak to you. Because most of the time, He speaks to us through the leaders He's put in our life, including our parents. And you got to understand, the moment that you cut off the head of your pastor and your youth pastor, and you cut off the head of your parents, you know what you've done? You've cut off the head of God. Because they're His representation. And you lose His favor. So you have to understand that the people God puts in your life are very important. And you need to be willing to hear what they have to say to you. Because the moment you take an opportunity to run them in the ground or say that their words are not, that has no value and cannot help you, and you shut them off, you are shutting God off. And He won't speak to you. You really need to think about that one. Another thing is it protects you from the rain. 
Umbrellas are nice, right? I used to live in Portland, Oregon. It rains all the time. And nobody really leaves the house without an umbrella. Because what? When you're under the umbrella, you don't get wet. Well, most of the time, anyways. I've had a couple of pretty bad umbrellas before. But if you're under God's umbrella, you don't get wet. How's that sound? All right? When you're under that umbrella, there is protection. And there is even freedom to move around a little bit. As long as you're under that umbrella. I would tell you this. As long as you're under the umbrella of God, He can help you deal with the problems of life and avoid some rain sometimes. Now, I know the Bible says it does rain on the just and the unjust, and there's some things that happen in life and you just can't avoid them. But there are a lot of things that do happen in life sometimes that if we would have had some authority in our life and had been under their covering, we wouldn't have got so wet. We wouldn't be so damp, okay? If we had just had some authority that we could turn to and then follow their direction... So understand this. Authority is going to help you defeat an enemy and stay away from a deceiver. It's going to give you favor with God. He's going to open up to you and speak to you and speak into your life himself. He'll speak into your life through authorities that he puts in your life and leaders. And he's going to help you stay away from some rain and keep you a little dry. Right? I have made a bunch of stupid mistakes. Everybody okay with stupid? All right. Yeah. need to remove that. Um, I've made a bunch of mistakes. And a lot of times it was because I didn't ask my leaders what they thought. And guess what happened? Man, I got rained on, like soaking wet. Which is horrible. Because I didn't turn to the authority in my life, the leaders in my life. The next one is this. When you submit yourself to authority and leadership, you have freedom to minister due to that submission to the authority. I can tell you this right now. I have gone to churches and preached not because they even knew me. They didn't even know me. I could have walked in, wander around, sit down. They'd have never thought I was the speaker because they didn't know me. I was only there because Pastor Aaron Soto said, you should have Chad Williams come because he'll bless your church. And I was able to minister due to my submission to his authority. It's almost like being undercover. Okay? I was there and I'm undercover and I'm moving about. And I'm operating under the even the anointing that Pastor Aaron Soto has. Because I've submitted myself to him and he's extended to me his favor and even his anointing and asked God to bless me and he's opened up a door for me and because I'm submitted to him, I'm able to minister. Now if I was a uh -oh, if I was really bad and I wasn't very smart and not submitted to Aaron Soto, I'd be sitting at the house looking at the wall on Friday night instead of at a rally. Because he wouldn't allow me to minister under his authority and his anointing. Okay? And so you have to recognize that whatever leadership and ministry you find yourselves in, when you submit to the leader of that ministry, it opens the doors up for you to minister and even tap into the anointing of the men and women that you are submitted to. And it will be a big blessing in your life. Now here's a couple things to think about. You can obey and not necessarily be submissive. Okay? It's important that we obey and submit in order to have true favor and blessings in our life. One example is Hebrews 13 and 17. It says, Obey those who rule over you, and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief. Don't grieve them, for that would be unprofitable for you. So the first part of that says, Obey those who rule over you and be submissive. Why should I do this? Because if I don't, it's unprofitable for me. If I create grief in their lives, that's unprofitable. The writer is clearly encouraging us to do two things. One, obey those who rule over us. And two, be submissive to those who rule over us. Those are two different things, guys. Two different directives. And we have to grab a hold of that understanding. This is why sometimes it's easy to obey but not really be submissive. You're just doing it, but you're complaining the whole time. Isaiah 1 and 19 says, If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Right? Look at that first part. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Two more things there. We see that again. Obedience and submission. 
Okay, willingness has to do with attitude. If you do what is asked of you with a bad attitude, then you're being obedient, but you are not submissive. Right? You're being obedient, and that's great. I appreciate that, but you're not submitted to whoever is asking you to do something. Think about this. You're playing PlayStation, and you're having a blast, and Mom tells you it's time to put the garbage out that you were supposed to do three days ago. Okay? And you don't want to do it, and Mom gets real serious with you, and you decide to do it. If you go do it, and you're complaining the whole time, you have a bad attitude. And you are not submitted to your mom. You're only obeying, but you're not submitting. Okay. What's that verse that says, to all things not my way to his feelings? Say that again? To all things not my way to his feelings. I might write that down. I don't know. Right out the hand. You got it, Ricky? It's Bible quizzers. Bible quizzers. Okay. Epic fail up here in the front. Is that my excuse? Last year's quiz, he's got to be amazing. I can tell you that my God-inspired iPhone does have that verse, and I can find it for you later. That helps. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. The iPhone's in the house. We can do it. So you got to think about that. A simple example, right? If you're doing things, if someone asks you to do something, if your ball coach asks you to do something, if your principal asks you to do something, if your youth leader asks you to do something, the Sunday school teacher asks you to do something, and you do it, but you whine and complain the whole time, guess what? You're being obedient, but you're not submissive. You have a bad attitude, and you need to think about that. You need to consider correcting that a little bit and being willing to have a good spirit and a good attitude and couple that with your obedience, okay? Obedience deals with our responsive actions toward authority. Okay, so obedience is about our response, our action when authority asks us to do something. But submission deals with our attitude toward that authority and that action. Okay, so when someone asks you to do something, you need to obey and do it. And then secondly, you need to have a good spirit about it. Now, I told you that story about John Bevere, and he had to go tell his staff, basically, that guess what? All these months of work is going down the drain because we're done. Pastor canceled it. He could have done two things. He could have been obedient, which he was, and he went and told them, and then walked in there and said, guys, guess what? Pastor just ruined it for us. He blew it. All this hard work is gone. I don't know what he's thinking, but unfortunately, we're not having a party Friday night. Guess what that would have been? I would have been obedient, but not submissive, right? That's a bad attitude. Guess what he did? He went in and said, hey, guys. He broke the news, but he did it positively. If you read the book. He told them, guess what, guys? We don't have to go through all the hassle of having a party. We got great news. God spoke to pastor, and, past, and God said he's got a better plan for us. And we're going to get to invest in this better plan. And he totally changed his attitude about it. And guess what? Because he did that, what did we talk about the other day? You get what you show. Everybody else was happy and smiling. You show it, you sew it, right? Everybody was happy and smiling because he was happy and smiling. He took the submissive route. And so you have to be willing to be obedient and you have to be submissive. You have to embrace both of those. First Chronicles 28, 9 says, And thou, Solomon, my son, know that the God of thy father and know the God of thy father and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. There's that willing again. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will find of thee, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off. Forever. Once again, we hear that willing mind. You've got to be willing. You have to be willing to submit. There has to be something that takes place in your attitude that makes you willing to do these things. Don't do it. Don't have that spirit, oh, I'm doing it, but I'm only doing it because I have to. That's not submission. Another thing is you can also be submissive and not obey. A good example of this is the parable Jesus told of two sons discussed in Hebrews 3. The one son had a willing attitude. He said, yes, sir. 
I'll go and I'll work in your vineyard. And he said it with zeal. He said it with a positive attitude. I'll do it. I'll work in your vineyard. Fortunately, he never did the work. He had a submissive attitude. He was willing. He was excited about it. But there was no action. He actually never showed up at the vineyard to work. And this happens sometimes. We get super good intentions. And we're submitted. And God says to do something. I'll do it, God. I'll do it. And then for whatever reason, it's not as important. And we don't actually do it. And so now we're submitted, but we're not obeying. And so you cannot separate the two. You've got to do both. You have good intentions and express them to their leadership sometimes and say, sure, I'll do it. I'll do it, Brother Rick. I promise I'll do it. And a week later, Brother Rick's like, well, how's it going? Oh, well, I didn't, I didn't get to do it. I'm going to do it, but I just didn't get to do it. I had to play checkers for like three days. So I didn't get to do it. So there's all these other things. I had to play PlayStation because I hadn't beat level six yet. And I might, you know, it's just, it, and it was really bad. And I, I, yes, but, uh, I didn't do it. And Brother Rick's really happy because you're submitted and willing, but he's really sad because you're not doing anything. Okay? You're submissive, but you're not obedient. Now, check out John Bevere. This guy's pretty tough. He calls that nice rebellion. Nice rebellion, okay? Nice rebellion. Next time you make your parents upset and they say, you're being rebellious, you can go, well, Mom, it was a nice rebellion. That was a nice rebellion. I use words like John Bevere said this is nice rebellion. Give me, give me some help here. Okay? He refers to it as nice rebellion. You guys have to recognize that nice rebellion is just as destructive as blatant rebellion. Submission with good intentions and no obedience will not stand the judgment of God. So when you're submitted with good intentions, but you're not obeying, you're not going to be able to stand the judgment of God. Okay, It's not going to fly. He's not going to let it pass. Now, some other quick things to consider and we'll be finished. Okay, Think about this. If you are always agreeing with your leaders, that is not submission. That is agreement. Okay? True submission only comes when there's a disagreement. If Rick and I are hanging out, Rick's pastor, and uh, Ryan's his youth pastor. And Rick comes to Ryan and says, man, we need to talk. i got this great idea. And Rick lays it out there, and it's beautiful. And Ryan's like, yes, pastor, that's awesome. Let's do it. Rick's not. Ryan's not being submissive necessarily. He's just agreeing. That's a great idea. It's just a moment of agreement, not necessarily a moment of Okay, submission. But now when Rick comes back a few weeks later and he's altered the plan a little bit and it really affects Ryan now in his ministry and he lays it out there and Ryan is in disagreement with Rick, Pastor Rick, Bishop, Pastor Emeritus Rick. Okay, now we have a moment of submission coming up here. Is he going to submit or is he going to run? Is he going to bring out some nice rebellion? Well, Brother, Pastor Rick, I got something. Let me open it up here for you. This is called Nice Rebellion. just want to introduce it to you, and I think this is a horrible idea, and I quit. Good luck. Good luck setting up chairs. I quit. Okay? Good luck with the media. I'm done. I don't like it. Or he can prove his submission. Okay? And he can say, okay, Pastor your pastor, and if that's what you think we should do, I'm with you. Okay? And so you have to understand, to really prove your submission, there's going to be moments where there's going to be a disagreement in opinions among leadership, and that's when you can prove whether you're submitted or not. And it's going to be based on your attitude in that moment and how you respond. Okay? Some people, I like, think they're super, super, super submitted to their pastor. Well, that's because they always agree with their pastor. They've never had a moment where pastor feels a little differently than they do and they've actually had to prove it you know and so the reality is is that there's going to be moments where you're going to prove that you're submitted to your authority and in those moments it's not going to be fun because there's disagreement taking place okay jordan
Say that again. You change your views to a match his? Is that what you're saying? I would, I would say that, I mean, you could call that agreement, but ultimately I'm going to say that's submission. That is without question submission, okay? And you're still agreeing, yes, I agree with that, but that's a moment of submission, you know? So then I guess I would say, so what he's saying basically is, is pastor brings a new idea to the table and you see that and you recognize that it's better. And so you're instantly like, okay, yeah, this is definitely better. Let's do this. That, that still, I guess, would be a form of agreement. Okay. But if you sit at the table and pastor gives you a better plan and you still look at it and say, I still don't think this is good. But pastor, if you want to do this, I'm with you. That's submission. Because you still have your feelings that maybe it could be better this way. But you're actually going to say, all right, let's do it, pastor. I'm with you. I mean, me and Pastor Soto are really good. We get along very well. We're two, still two human beings with leadership mentalities and different philosophies sometimes, okay? And so there's moments where we'll have discussions and somebody submits. You know what I'm saying? Most of the time, he's going to have his way. He's senior pastor, right? And he's, he's under the will of God and that kind of thing. But if you sit there and he gives you the new plan, you're like, whoa, this is definitely better. I'm with you, Pastor. You know, there is some... A hint of submission there. I would say that. You know, it's kind of both, borderline both. But if he lays out the plan and you're still not so sure, and you still feel down in your gut, you know, I just don't think this is going to work. But you're like, Pastor, I'm with you. That's really, truly submission. And you're saying, Pastor, I'm with you. And then you give him your heart, and you give him your 100%, your 100% focus and attention and energy to fulfill his dream and fulfill God's plan that God's given him. Go ahead, Lydia. Well, I think you're gonna to have to you're gonna to have to spend time with your pastor and figure out how your how your pastor operates is one thing I would say. Okay. Now, if you have a good attitude, you know, if I was pastoring and one of you were working with me and I said, you know what, Lydia, I've got a better plan. Look at this and, and see what you think. And and you look at it and you're still not so sure and you say, Pastor, you know what, I, I'm willing to to do what you want to do. So I'm I'm submitted to you. I'm behind you 100. percent And he says, Okay, great. And then you look at it and you go, you know what, Pastor? Uh, what if what if right here we try this? What do you think? What do you think about that? Okay? You have to have the right spirit, right attitude. Rick, you can you could probably give some good input here in a second. You have to have the right spirit, okay? You have to understand you're just making a suggestion. Okay? And then if you got a right spirit, he may look at it and say, you know what, that's not a bad idea. Or he may feel pretty confident because that's what God really wants him to do. And he may say, you know what, I, st I still feel comfortable about this. What do you think, Rick? Yeah, I agree. I think you need to kind of know how. I think you need to know how your pastor works. So you, know, you need to kind of know their style a little bit, kind of, kind of understand a little bit of where they're going. You know, uh, if your pastor is saying, you know, we're moving forward in a building program, you know, Lydia, you come to him, you're like, well, I really don't think that's probably the best idea. We kind of still have some debt and stuff like that. You know, he probably would be as open to comments like that, but if he has, if it's something about outreach or something that you're specifically involved in, then I, I would feel that the pastor would probably be open to, to your input, but if it's something that you probably are not in a ministry for or don't really have any connection to, um, then your input probably isn't as valid. I think, I think you really have to learn your leadership, who's leading you in a ministry, okay? Really figure out who they are. Watch them, observe them, see how they operate. And what, what you, if you'll recognize this right now, it'll really save you a lot of heartache. If you will learn that you, when you operate under their leadership, whichever way they want to operate, and you do it with submission, God's going to give you a chance someday to live out your dream in ministry too and put your plans together, and He'll bless you, okay? But every pastor's different, okay? Some pastors... They love, you know, they love to throw thoughts around. They love to sit at a table and say, I really feel good about this. And I know it's different than what you had thought about. And, you know, you submit to that and say, okay, pastor, I got your back, whatever. And then you look at it and say, you know, what do you think about this? And that pastor just loves throwing stuff around. 
And the other pastors, they're just geared differently. And I'm not here to say either one's better. They're just geared differently. They they may have grew up in a different ministry, and so they operate the way they've seen. And so they're, they're just like, okay, I really feel like that's just the best way, and so we're just going to do this. And if you learn your ministry and that you're under and your authority and you watch them, it'll make your life a lot better. Because then you can just say, I know how my pastor operates. I'm going to operate the way he operates. I think one other thing, too, is that there's different generations. So we've got... We've got a generation of traditionalists, which was born between uh, about 19, before 1945. We've got baby boomers, 1945 and up, and then we've got we've got other generations. Most of the pastors at this time are, are baby boomers um, uh, in your churches, and so sometimes you have to kind of understand their generation. Sometimes some of the older pastors may not um, may not understand or or um, may not understand exactly where you're coming from. So you need to make sure that you you have a plan. If you go to talk to leadership, that you just don't go walk up to them and off the cuff spout something out and half of it comes out wrong. But maybe that you jot down a plan. So when I talk with my pastor, a lot of times uh, I'll jot stuff down and have a plan. So when I go and have a conversation with him, pick up the phone and talk to him, I know exactly what I'm going to talk about, what my objectives are, and, and how I'm going to approach conversation because I've learned how he thinks. I know what questions he's going to ask, so I have to think out those uh, responses in advance. That's great. So you just have to ask God to help you. Say, God, just help me help me understand how my pastor operates and so I can support him, okay? So I can really help him and be at my best, right? And Rick's right. You know, you all have busy pastors. And so when you do feel like you could make a positive suggestion and you learn how you should do that, Please go into that meeting prepared, okay? Because he's busy, you know, and he wants, he's probably interested in what you have to say. But don't go in and mumble around because you didn't write some notes down, you know? Show him you have initiative and you really love and you really feel like what you have to say is very important and it could be helpful. That is so good. Thank you for that. Any other questions on that? Uh, I don't have a question. Do you have any other questions? Yeah, I'm Another who? situations we're talking about. You got one guy that's not submitted and obeying. You got one guy that's submitted and not obeying. Um, I have heard preachers say that there are many miracles in obedience alone. That God really honors obedience. Okay? And so maybe just off the cuff here, I would say that God really does value obedience and the job got done, the work was done, and so he was pleased in that parable. I will actually does say that obedience is better than sacrifice. There you go. When you hearken to the You got it. So obedience is very critical, okay? 